I fasted during the month of Ramadan and Alhamdulillah, um, after 30 days, I've managed to do the complete fast. Um, and uh, somewhere near the end of Ramadan, that's when I had a dream. I was uh, basically walking down a hallway to a man sitting uh, at, at a couch and he was just smiling at me. So he has this really warm and friendly presence. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum anahu al-haqq awalam yakhfi bi rabbika annahu ala kulli shay'in shaheed And Allah says that, you know, I've showing you the signs in the horizons and all around the world. And do you still question that, you know, I am your Lord? Am I not a witness enough for you that this is the truth? Say Bismillah, bro. What are you doing? Yo, it's in my head, man. Stuff. Hey, I like that. I like that. I think there's another thing too. It's it's the perseverance aspect too. Like we're more willing to stick through with things that we set out with an intention. It's impossible to have empathy for others if you're not patient. So my love, bless you for that. First of all, I agree with the fact that the whole thing you said about friends, where it's like if, if they're affecting you more than you're affecting them, then you should probably get some new friends. You want to be investing stocks shares bonds you want to be investing in crypto because there's this thing called inflation which means every year that passes by the value of a dollar goes lower and lower and lower and the reason being is because they're printing more money right that's why money is haram at least the paper money is haram provided that you're actually there and you're being a good father and the mother's being a good mother best conditions and behind the mic hamza andreas zortzis we will go in with our final three with Brother Anhel, inshallah. Inshallah, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. It's not just a responsibility on you, it's a responsibility on all the children, especially your father. In our private area, is very elastic. And yeah, if you go too fast, the skin will literally crease up into like the edge of like the little clipper things, and you will literally clip your skin. You don't want to be on YouTube or the internet or anything. That that amount of time, but it's it's the the fact is that's what we're doing. Ooh, look at that stretch! Assalamu alaikum so warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to the Realist Podcast in the Dunya, the Three Muslims. We're joined here with a very special guest. Salam alaikum. How are you doing? Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. So your um, Muslim name is Ferdos, and then your and I know your old name was Harold, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so what do you prefer we call you? Ferdos is great. Ferdos is great. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. So a lot of our viewers might be familiar with you that saw your revert story, but for those that aren't, tell us a little bit about your story. Who? Cool. Uh, how should I begin? Um, okay, maybe. I was born a Catholic. I was baptized when I was a baby. I went to church every Sunday. I joined the band before. I used to play music with the band. Um, church goer most of the time until about like uh, 18 to 20 years old. That was when I started to serve the army in Singapore. We have to, it's a national service. So all of us have to go to the army. Um, and then I came back and I needed to go travel overseas to pursue my degree. That's when I went to Australia and started to study about philosophy and questioned a lot about the meaning of life, why we're here, um, if if reality is real or something like that. So, um, and then I started to look deeper into my past faith and discovered that Christianity wasn't something that 
I really believe in because I started to doubt the divinity of Jesus. And um, from then on, I became more like an atheist, partying every day. Um, I had this idea that if I'm happy, I could make everyone else around me happy. Uh, that's perfect. You can live a happy life. And uh, so I started to live like a YOLO kind of life, uh, a day at a time, uh, look forward to the weekends kind of thing. Um, and it was not until my parents gave me a call and I was in school one day and said that my grandma passed away. And that was when I thought, who is in control of death? Because, mm-hmm. you know, um, as much as we want to be happy and to make people around us happy, um, death is something that is an unhappy event and you can't control it. And that got me thinking that there has to be a higher power out there, someone in control of death at least. Um, so I started to ponder hard and thought that there's probably a supreme being in control of that uh, aspect of life. And that was when I, I became agnostic, but I didn't want a religion to tell me who God was because I always had this idea that it was a man-made thing. Um, maybe because what I studied in school, you know, how they got us to understand that, you know, all these are human constructs. We need something to believe in so that we feel safe. Um, but then again, the idea of, you know, no God is also not logical because, you know, who can control death? So I was agnostic, but I didn't want a religion. Um And then I came back to Singapore. That was after I graduated from school. And when I came back, I started my job in the bank. Um, And that's where I met uh, a lady who is a Muslim. And she, she, we started to, you know, have a friendship going on and feelings were starting to develop. And uh, I told her up front that we won't, we won't be together because you're Muslim and I'm a YOLO kind of person. (laughs) So it's like two different visions in life, different aspects, right? So how are we going to be together? And she said, why don't you give Islam a chance? Go find out about it. And I said, sure. I mean, I'm open-minded enough to to give it a shot, but I'm going to ask the religious teacher all my questions. And if he can't answer them, or if I find that it's not logical, I'll just you know back away. I will not believe in this religion. And she said, fine, go ahead, ask all your questions. So she directed me to the convert center in Singapore. And that's when I, I went to the introduction to Islam course. Um, it was very basic, um, like the belief of one God and who is Allah, something like that. So I started writing, writing down my questions and I had three questions for the teacher. And I asked him, the first question was, mm, why do you say there's only one God? Why, why isn't it like two or three or four? Uh, why do you believe in just one God? And he said, well, it's very, very simple. You know, he gave me this analogy that if there was a God that made the human head and a God that made the human hands and a God that made the human legs, which God would say that, you know, he is good enough to make the human body complete and perfect. And the God that created the head would say, I'm much better because I gave human ideas and thoughts and intelligence Maybe the God of the hands would say I'm better because I feed the man. Or the God of the human legs would say I'm better because, you know, I take him to distant places. Um, So there has to be a central point where, you know, a God that's all powerful, that created the human being in its perfect form. And uh, that made me think a lot, but it wasn't convincing enough. So he went on to say that what about... Computers, look at them, you know, you have a monitor, you have a mouse, you have a keyboard, um, but you still need a central power source to to light it all up, to start the computer. That that gave me uh, a glimpse into the idea of Tawheed, the belief in one God in Islam. And I thought, oh, that makes a lot of sense. So uh, all the polytheistic religion suddenly just didn't make any sense to me. If, If they believe in like three or four gods, just wouldn't make any logical sense. So we came to a point of uh, having just three religions that believe in one God, which is uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And so I asked him the next question. uh, Why don't you say Jesus is God or Buddha is God or anyone else is God? Why do Muslims call Allah uh, the God of all? And he said, um, from a Christian perspective, if you believe that Jesus is God, 
um, the definition of divinity in dictionary would mean that, you know, someone who cannot die. And uh, if Jesus was immortal, uh, how is he able to die, die on a cross? If, for Christians, you believe that he died on the cross. Um, and then I thought, about he rose third day, right? <laughs> he said, but you see, um, then it would not be a complete sacrifice because um, for, for a sacrifice to be accurate, you know, you will lose it forever. And then that, that would be a proper sacrifice. And otherwise, you know, because Christians, we, you know, as Christians, we believe that if um, for the sake of forgiving all our sins, um, Jesus died on the cross and his blood kind of washes all of your sins from the past and forgives you. And God forgives you through that act of sacrifice. So there's a need for a sacrifice to happen. Otherwise, you know, there's no forgiveness. And uh, so that, that again brought in the next question. He asked me, would a God be more merciful if he needs, you, he needs to sacrifice an innocent man who is the son, right? In order to forgive someone's sin. Or would you say a God is more merciful if he just forgives you when you ask for forgiveness? So that question alone made so much sense. Like, you know, you, you can just go up to your parents and say you're sorry for something, but why can't God do the same? Like, why can't you just go up to God and say, I'm sorry for whatever I've done wrong? Why do you need a sacrifice? You know? So Christianity was written off <laughs> from, from my, my question. And then Buddhism. So I asked him what about Buddha. And he said, Buddhist is a way of life, um, but the issue with Buddhism is they do not have a communication with God. They do not believe in a God. And so a follower of Buddhism uh, knows how to lead a good life without a guiding force, without someone to connect to, um, a supreme being like God to, to ask you know, for even your forgiveness, to ask for guidance. You don't have someone to communicate with. And that's what's lacking Buddhism. So that again made sense to me. Um, so I asked, so what do Muslims believe in? So who, who do Muslims believe? And he said, Allah, we believe in one true God, the God, the creator of all things. Um, he cannot be compared to anything. And basically he's not, give, he's not born or he's not, he doesn't give birth to. So he, he basically translated Surah Ikhlas um, in English to me which is the simplest way to explain uh, who God is to the Muslims. And that sounded like something I have always believed in. Like you always believe there's a superpower, a supreme being out there who created all things. And that made a lot of sense. And also because when I studied philosophy, you know, we had this notion, this, this discourse about uh, if people could see God, um, how is it possible when we have five limited senses? For example, you know, your eyes have uh, limited range. You can see uh, hearing as well, taste buds as well. Um, so with all that limitations, how are we able to define what is real? How are we able to define uh, divinity? How do we find God with just our limited senses? The universe is something that is so vast and big and you can't use a ruler to measure the universe. But what we are trying to do is measure the power of God with our five senses. And that alone kind of wake me up even more <laughs> because I, I thought like, yeah, that makes our sense. You know, Jesus couldn't be God because he's, he's a man, right? And you can see everything about him. And God is way more powerful than that. He's the creator, right? So um, so I, I had uh, started to believe in Islam, but... I didn't want to immediately jump into the religion because I know that there are a lot of, you know, things that you have to do, like uh, fasting during the month of Ramadan, uh, if possible, you know, perform your Hajj and you have to eat halal food and pray five times a day. So those were the conditions that you know, Islam has set out to, to guide people. But at the point in time, I wasn't sure if I was able to take all that. So I tried one step at a time. Like, for example, I would stop eating pork and then stop uh, eating food that are not halal and slowly slowly i you know even quit drinking so, and and then afterwards when just nice you know ramadan came and i said okay it's about time 
it's about time I should give this a shot because, you know, if I can fast for the whole month of Ramadan, then I think I can live a Muslim life. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's about time also to let my girlfriend then know, you know, if this religion is something I really want to follow uh, and not waste her time. So I, I fasted during the month of Ramadan and Alhamdulillah, um, after 30 days, I've managed to do the complete fast. Um, and uh, somewhere near the end of Ramadan, that's when I had a dream. And I woke up one morning and uh, be before that, uh, the dream was I was uh, basically walking down a hallway to a man sitting uh, at, at a couch and he was just smiling at me. So he has this really warm and friendly presence towards him. So I walked towards him and he asked me a question. He just looked at me and smiled and said, um, brother, when are you going to be part of the family? And at the moment I woke up. So I think, thought, wow, this is amazing. I mean, probably I have been reading too much Islam. <laughs> Maybe I started to dream Islam. <laughs> so um, I didn't think much about it. Uh, same day, my friend called me out for, for dinner and he's a Muslim. So he said, Hey, his name is Ibrahim. So it's, it's quite amazing. Like Abraham, Ibrahim. <laughs> so he's like saying, uh, Hey brother. So I saw you've been going to the convert center. Are you thinking of becoming a Muslim? And I said, wow, that's a coincidence. I just had a dream just a few hours ago. And this guy is asking me the same question. So I thought, okay, maybe this is still a coincidence. I went home that night and so happened the dream uh, happened again. And this time I, I woke up, it's a Saturday morning, I sat on my bed um, and then I, I decided to say a short prayer. I said, dear God, I believe in you. I believe you're the all-powerful. Um, I'm just a lost soul. You know, I'm, I need guidance right now and I seek your help to, to show me the way. And um, I think I'm tired of you know, this confusion, please help me. Um, I'm going to flip the Bible and the Quran randomly three times. And whichever verse that my eyes set upon, I will just, um, uh, I would hope that it's a clear message from you saying that this is the truth, this is the way, and just follow me or something like that. Um, and so I said, okay, I'll start with the Bible since I was first a Catholic, I was first baptized one. So I took the Bible and uh, close my eyes and I just randomly flip open a, a page and I was I can't remember the verse or the, the page but it wasn't clear the thing about a bible is it's made of a lot of testimonies and stories so you know you can't just take a part and just kind of make sense out of it or uh, you can have like 10 or 20 different interpretations of the same verse probably and you can make it out to be whatever you want sometimes so I tried three times. It wasn't very clear. It was like halfway through a story. You probably need to read the whole story to understand that particular verse that I read. So, um, like I said, I can't remember which verse, so I can't quote it right now. So three three times I tried and it did not sink into my heart. So I just uh, decided to tr give the Quran a shot, the next one. So that's when I, I said, okay, I put the Bible down. It's time for the Quran. <laughs> took out the Quran, it's an English translation of the Quran, um, I closed my eyes and I opened, and the first thing I saw was in Surah Al-Hajj, that's uh, chapter 22, verse 54, no, 54, and it, it goes like, uh, do, you, do you want me to, to recite it? Oh. Yeah, bro, go ahead, yeah. go for it, Bismillah. <laughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And I've given knowledge to those uh I mean, I can't remember the English one, but I know in general what it means. It says that, you know, I've given knowledge to those who, who seek it. And isn't it obvious enough that this is the truth from your Lord? And, and for those who believe in it, their hearts humbly submit to it, something like that. So um, 
I I thought, okay, maybe this is still a coincidence. I was still in denial, you know. And uh, I closed the book again and said, okay, this is the second try. And I closed my eyes. And again, I flipped open a, a new page. And I was brought to Surah Fusilat, chapter 41, verse 53. And it goes, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana lahum anahu al-haqq. Awalam yakhfi bi rabbika annahu ala kulli shay'in shaheed. And Allah says that, you know, I've shown you the signs in the horizons and all around the world. And do you still question that, you know, I am your Lord? Am I not a witness enough for you that this is the truth? So it's like he was even answering, he was continuing the question of, you know, does he exist in the next verse? Although it's from a different part of the Quran. And immediately my heart was like trembling in awe, you know, that like as if I was really having conversation with God at this point of time, I I, I humbled myself. I, I I kind of like have tears in my eyes, and I said, "Thank you for answering my prayers, and and I'm sorry for putting you to the test. I I now that I've already declared to you that I'll follow, you know, follow you based on this test, right? Um, there's nothing that's gonna pull me back and from that day of forward I said I submit to you with all my heart and I believe in Islam so I, I, I gave the convert center a call I said uh, how do I become Muslim and and then they, they brought me in to, to take my shahada so that's that's the revert story and, and of course I told my my uh, girlfriend then I said um, I got something good to tell you <laughs> that I've decided to be a Muslim and she, she, she was so happy and she said, you know how many nights of tahajuds I did just to ask Allah to guide you to, to the path. And um, I mean, she's, she's such an angel that, you know, we, we got married. And so that's how we have our, now we have our child, the son. And that's, that's the love ending. I was <laughs> the love story of it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So that's the story. Yeah. You, you got out. tears in my eyes. Oh, from Allah. You got tears in my eyes. And that, that was beautiful, the recitations, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, mashallah. Yeah, mashallah. Bro, I wanted to say something, uh, Firdos, real quick, that maybe like I could relate to you on a personal level on this, and a lot of our viewers might as well, that when you talk about how at the end, Allah gave you that perfect, you know, that, you know, when you watch movies and, you know, they talk about this beautiful ending to the story, right? Yeah. That, subhanAllah, Allah granted us like the perfect ending that it could have been. You know what I mean? Like Allah could have give, like, taken one thing away from us or been like, you know what? You were doing this or you were doing that or, you know, I'll take this away from you and humble you. But Allah really could have done that, but chose to give us that perfect forever after type ending, you know? So I'm eternally grateful for that. And I know you are too. Yes. Thank you, brother. Yeah. Mashallah. Mashallah. I can relate to the, uh, the part where you read the Quran and you felt like Allah is talking to you. You're discussing with Allah. I feel like yeah. that, mashallah, that feeling, you get like the shivers down your spine. You feel that, that that void that was in your heart is now filled. And you're like, the one who made me, the one who created me, the one who owns everything, the one who, if I just say, you know, alayhi tawakkal to upon him, I, I, I rely on. If I just say that, then he'll take care of everything. This is the person or not the person, but this is the, you know, the existence. This is Allah who I'm now speaking to, subhanAllah. It's such a beautiful feeling. That, that arises in the heart and I, I i felt that again when you were telling your story because i'm just like subhanallah like that is guidance allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon a person asking for guidance would never misguide them never lead them astray and subhanallah may allah bless you bro because that story was like my my tears aren't crying my, my eyes aren't crying like on hell but my heart is 100 percent mashallah you, oh, yeah, you were reciting yeah. and, and i felt like like, I don't know, it was, it was pure, bro. Like, like I, I literally started feeling like tuned up. I was like, no, 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 but you, 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 you doing a podcast. Chill out, bro. Chill out. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was, that was so good, man. 
Yeah. And so my next question to you is, do you know how a lot of people say that uh, if you sincerely cry out to Allah to guide me, uh, Allah will guide? You know how everyone says that's true. Now, there's a lot of atheists that are saying uh, or they, they claim to say that I do cry out to God. I do try to reach out to God and I don't get anything. I don't get guidance. So God doesn't exist. Does he hate me? Does he not like me? Does he not want to guide me? So do you think the issue with them is that they really haven't fully cried out? Mm. I think there's a couple of issues there. Uh, one, yeah, I believe in sincere and humble submission. Like you need to really want the truth so badly that you give up everything for it kind of thing. Um, secondly, you need to ask with an earnest heart um, and pray in in sense like it's your last day. And you really want him to show you. Because, you know, he doesn't need to show you because he can say, look around you. And that is my creations and you will know who I am, right? But you are forcing him, sort of like you are putting him in a spot to show you something. That's that's the other thing. Um Thirdly, I think because I've went through fasting, kind of like, I think physically I've prepared to let anything happen. Sort of, so I think maybe that kind of prepared me for this. Um, and so that's, that's the three things. Uh, next is, I think, the, the, the perspective of how we want something to happen. You know, in, in, in human terms, we, we need you know, maybe a, a volcano to erupt, then you say, oh, there's a God or something, <laughs> or thunder and lightning, right? Um, but you see, we are, again, relying so heavily on our five senses, and yet they have, we have people that can't see in their whole life and believe in God, or who can cannot hear anything, who are lack, lacking one of these five senses, and they believe in God. Um, so they have no one to influence them who God is. Like, for example, you have a, a deaf person who has never heard an imam talk to him or her about God, but they believe in God. So that, that alone shows you a lot about, you know, how narrow-minded a person is, not open enough to accept that there is a creator of all things. And, you know, you, you can't argue with um, how can the universe come about if it starts from zero, right? <laughs> zero can't create one. <laughs> yeah, so that, that alone has logic logical flaws if you believe that things can just happen without God. Yeah. yeah. But it Ooh, reminds it me sense. of uh, <laughs> it didn't it made sense. It made perfect sense. It reminded me of uh, the conversation I was having with my grandpa yesterday. And um, you know, we were we were actually debating about because he, he's he's proper Christian and he was like asking me like why am I Muslim? Like why do I read the Quran? But um Aside from that, once we found common grounds, he was saying that uh, people don't really experience God or they don't, they don't experience that guidance until all they have is nothing but God. Whereas like everything is stripped away. And it's like once you give up everything, that's when God like truly guides you because that's when you are truly sincere, when you have nothing left. And it's like a lot of people might misinterpret that and say like, oh, do I have to give up my house? Do I have to give up my relationships? Do I have to give up my job? And it's like, no, but for that time being, you have to fully submit and like give up everything in your mind. Stop being so damn attached to things to be able to sincerely come to the creator for that guidance. So alhamdulillah, bro. Marshall, uh, well said. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, so how old are you again? Uh, 34. <laughs> 34. Yeah. Okay. See, I was thinking you were like in your 20s, bro. Bro, you look good for 34, yeah. mashallah. Yeah, you look good, mashallah. Yeah. So, so a lot of people are watching and they don't know that, you know, you're married, you have a kid too. So, uh, mm -hmm. tell me some lessons that you've learned as a father now um, from before when you didn't have any kids. So, um, even after reversion, Allah still puts us to the test. And as a father, I know there are certain things that I recognize as a test from God. For example, um, you know, when you spend more time with your work instead of spending more time with your family, 
sometimes you see it in your eyes, the the your the, the child's eyes, you know, when they look at you and say, you know, as though they're saying, You're not home, I haven't seen you for some time. Uh, could you be here more with me? So they started to cry. So so when babies cry, sometimes we think, you know, they're being uh, misbehaving. Some of us might think that way, but actually it's an indication to you as a parent that you've been missing out in the person's life. And and I think um I think a lesson from that. Like I should spend more time with my children, uh, my child, and um, to really know how to balance between what's in the dunya, what's in the ahira, and what have you know Allah has blessed you with. You should not take them for granted. So you know, sometimes my wife would tell me, "You should remember this and this." This kind of wakes me up again. So even as a revert, we are always, you know, put ourselves in a in a position to be reawakened over and over again. Because when you're real awakened, you know that Allah is loves you, right? He puts you to the test. That's why he, that's why he, he puts you to the test. Yeah. So how has it been like now that you have a kid? Like, because is it what you expected? Or is no. it something completely different? Mm. I always go with the flow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was like um okay i we, we were prepared to have kids it wasn't something like we we we, we it was an accident something mm-hmm. like that we really wanted to have a kid um we we prayed and asked for for blessings from allah um i would say that now when i look at my kids i and i look at the situation of our current you know world and that what scares me is his future, of course. And uh, I mean, I was a rebellious child when I was young. Um, I could have just listened to my parents and, you know, stay a Christian. <laughs> or, or you know, just tell the girl that, or just, you know, tell myself I can meet another girl. Why, why would I need to go through the whole process of finding Islam <laughs> and all that? Um <laughs> I guess somehow a part of me really wanted to know the meaning of life and, and truth and all that. So when I see my, my, my child in the future, I'm worried about, you know, whether he get influenced by friends or something or, or music or something that, you know, takes him far away from Islam. So I do whatever I can to, to, to you know, build bridges for him to God. What I mean is, you know, a wise man once told me that, you know, the role of a father is not so much as um, someone who just educates or or just scold your son if he's not he's misbehaving or something. But the role of a father is more uh, like a person who, you know, builds a lot of bridges or lays the ropes that brings the person back home to Allah. Um, so in the event of your death or in the event, you know, um, you he gets lost at least your child can remember these ropes that you lay for him and and return home and because you can't control his destiny when he reaches puberty or you know 18 or 20 years old he will have his own mind he will have his own friends and he'll go through a whole a whole phase of his own so all you can do is now establish the ropes as much as you can guide him as much as you can and uh, inshallah, he will still be guided even the hereafter, to the hereafter. Yeah. So the, what I do is I, I do videos. There's the whole reason why I started my whole YouTube channel was mainly to, you know, put this information out there, this knowledge I, I gathered over the years online. So it's like a digital library of information. <laughs> and if, if one day should I, you know, untimely death or anything, he still have these places to go. To, to find information so that's what i do and that's what i, I take from being a dad to think of the future for my children <laughs> yeah Mashallah, i get they answer your question sometimes i get yeah no away. you answered <laughs> you answered it <laughs> Mashallah, Mashallah. so i saw one video saying catholic dad reacts to my reversion oh, from you yeah. i didn't watch it though because I, uh, I think I was so excited with your revert video that I was just sending it to people. Uh, but for me and a lot of people that haven't seen that video, tell me how your parents reacted. Okay. And, and before that, 
you yeah. I don't think you you told us if you did I probably forgot when did you revert oh 2014 and November the 2nd so that's okay. about seven over years ago yeah um my dad he's a very strong uh believer and Catholicism yeah Catholic believer um I know in his heart he really wants me to come back to being to be a Christian um but I I know where I, I I want what I want, um. But I love him dearly and my mom dearly. So when I do the video, I of course I told them, you know, the purpose of the video is to be candid, to be free, to be you know share our ideas and thoughts and be comfortable with it. Um. And most importantly, know that I love you as a son, and uh, I would like to you know hear hear what you have your thoughts about me being a Muslim. So that's how I started making the video. Um, and my dad was uh, sharing his thoughts about it. And I, tr- I use it as a way to also, you know, get him to understand more about Islam. And in the video, uh, I just mainly asked him some basic questions like, you know, don't you know that we are from the Abrahamic faith? Uh, we are all children of Abraham. Ibrahim. Um, and do you know that even if you don't know this, like Christianity is actually a Middle Eastern religion because it started in the Middle East, right? But everyone has this idea that it looks like a European thing. Uh, and, and that itself kind of blocks you from, you know, looking at it from a holistic way. Uh, and you start to separate Arabs as, you know, they're just all Muslims, right? <clears throat> and Jews are Jews, right? And Christians are Europeans, but not true because Jesus is a Palestinian, right? <laughs> so, so now you start to see it in that way. You start to see that actually we are a Middle East. We are believe in a Middle Eastern religion, right? It came from the Middle East, and um, and that I hope can break some barriers to see that we are still united in 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 faith in the sense that we believe in one God. In his perspective, he thinks you know the Trinity is one God. Um, but of course, I try to make sense out of that and, and never try to be disrespectful in any way. So the video just covers those areas of, of his thoughts. Yeah. Inshallah. And what about your mother? My mom? My mom is more... Um, because she, she's, she's not um, a Christian or anything. She's She's been a free thinker for the longest time. <laughs> but... Uh, she just follow customs and traditions which um, her parents taught her when she was young. So she always thought that it was the guiding light because you're following your parents for many years and suddenly someone is telling you that, you know, what your parents are doing is not right, is, you know, and this is, is, is not necessary and stuff. So she, she also couldn't, um, she couldn't see why Islam is the way. But she doesn't. What she doesn't know is what she already believes in is very Islamic. Like <laughs> she believes in in the existence of a God, a Creator, a one God. She believes that you know when we pray, we are communicating with God, and that's why it's necessary to pray as often as we can. That you should pray um, during the day before you go to work to thank God, you know, and to ask for protection. And then you should also pray at least before you sleep because that's when you thank God for all the things he blessed you. So even for five daily prayers, she agreed two out of five, (laughs) at least of the prayer you need to do. And um, she understands why it's important uh, to eat halal food because halal food is cleaner and stuff. So she has this understanding and concept, but what she hasn't uh, given is her whole heart into Islam. Maybe because... She thinks she still has this lens over her, thinking that, you know, it's it's a Middle Eastern religion and it's not the same culture as us. How can we embrace a religion that is so different from us? You know, that kind of thinking. So, um, and you see on TV, right? People with beards means they are Muslim or something, or people, people who look Arab, or they are they are all Muslims, right? But if you start people like that, when they start seeing their own race or their own country or people doing the same thing, then they start to think, yeah, maybe it's true, you know? So I think the media plays a very important part in showing a more balanced view um, instead of something that's polarizing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I can only pray to Allah and ask for Hidayah to be given to her. Yeah. I mean, inshallah, bro. Inshallah. I don't want to steal all the questions because I know that the 
other two might have some questions. So do you guys have anything to say or should yeah. I go on? Rami's been a little quiet. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I've just been, this is, it's usually when we have a really great guest on, mashallah, I, I just sit and I reflect and I think about, you know, what they're saying. Um, and uh, when I get in that mode, I get really quiet. But subhanAllah, like the story really strikes me, especially when it comes to your parents and what you just spoke about, subhanAllah. Uh, one thing, one, one piece of advice, or at least one reminder I want to give is, is it's, it's really important to, one, look at them as Hamza Zorsa said when he came on, look at them as like a blank canvas, right? Even if, if you have to stop seeing them as mom and dad for a second, just look at, you know, who they are, what they stand for, what they believe, their personality. Just look at them as a blank canvas and kind of build off of that. And also come to, to common terms with what you can. So, for example, if your mom doesn't want to give up culture, then tell her she doesn't necessarily have to give up culture, right? She still has her culture, her background, her upbringing. It's just taking the true, pure belief, and, and applying it to where it's to be applied. Like, for example, if, if she believed in some scientific theories, is that going to come and ruin her culture? No, not necessarily. So if you believe in one God and, and this religion, there may be some things where it's like, okay, this is not allowed. And you remove that from the culture. But altogether, if you look at the holistic picture, you don't really have to give up, you know, who you are. It's not like you're going to be an auto, like trans, trans uh, ethnic auto or something all of a sudden. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, in, in regards to everything else, bro, subhanAllah, the stories is wallah, it's so touching, mashallah. May Allah bless you for sharing it with us and then for your YouTube and, and bless you and your family. Bro, what you said about having a, a you know a son and being a father, I'm not a father yet, man, but I thought about it a lot. And that just brought like a whole new perspective. SubhanAllah, which is probably why I'm so <laughs> deep in thought, but mashallah. about laying yeah. the ropes, yeah. bro. Yeah. Laying the ropes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's why they said, you know, about being an imam. In the family, yeah, it's something like like you're the 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 guy who lays the ropes, even for your wife to join you in Jannah. So that's one of the the thing that like, the guy told me is that wow, that's the role of a father. So that's why Allah puts you up in a different like, kind of like a father status, right? Um, so it's always good for a Muslim to get married, to be a father, and to you know, to play that role. It it gives you a greater insight to you know the mercy of Allah. Yeah, because when the father prays or the mother prays, you know, Allah listens to to what he pleases to Allah. He asks for help and stuff, right? Um, and you're, you're right, brother. You, you mentioned, because I do, sorry, I was just responding to that. Um, you're right to say that um, you can still do the culture and stuff, but the only issue is because what you see around you, like your friends, right? Yeah, this is maybe might might sound like a bit weird, but <laughs> because in 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 Singapore at least, right? When we see somebody with a hijab on, they start to recognize it as a particular race of people wearing the hijab, you know. So they think it's all Malays that are wearing the hijab, when actually you have Chinese also wearing the hijab. So they couldn't see past that, and then think that it's a Malay religion, <laughs> you know. So, so what happened is is also reinforced by by the media or even from religious bodies themselves that say Malay Muslim they like to add the the ethnicity with the the religion and and that creates an image in a person's mind thinking that yeah. you know you must be a Malay then you can be a Muslim something like that you know so know. so so that the challenge is for us doing that one is to to break that. Um, the perception to see that it's yeah. universal religion and to also see that it's possible to still keep certain parts of your culture as long as it doesn't go against the religion yeah. um, you can do that and sometimes people don't listen to logic I realize yeah. and so when you recite our Fatiha or you recite some part of the Quran and you explain those verses to them in their language they are more likely to you know submit like my mom she started crying after I recited Fatiha you should watch that video. Yeah, she's, I mean, like she had a bit of tears and said, I've never heard you pray to me before. I said, well, nobody prays in front of you, mom. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, people pray in secret. People don't really, you know, come up to you. Mom, I'm going to pray to you now. But <laughs> I mean, maybe, maybe in church last time, I don't know. But um, it's most, it's sweeter to, to do it in secret, right? So, but I told her that um, because there's healing qualities in the prayer, when you listen to this, you feel like as if just close your eyes and just immerse yourself in the experience of listening to the Arabic words that are recited. So when I did the Fatiha for her, 
it was an experience more than than telling what is right or wrong and that experience was what gave her you know uh tears in her eyes or you know a humble heart after that so she was more calm after you recite something something to take uh, home with you i think oh, man that's something i learned in my adult life at least that you know you don't always need that perfect philosophical argument or religious argument to uh put someone in their place or challenge them or debate them you know where everyone is just someone walking around that needs to be refuted right it's almost like leading by example first and also then following up with just guiding them and showing them the beauty of islam and oftentimes it's 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 better to say little and mean more than to just say too much you know okay. yeah. so my next question would be being a muslim for the last seven ish years for you seven eight years what advice would you have because as as we try to be good men in and uh, lead people by example we realize that it's better that we can guide people to not make the mistakes that we have, right? Just because, you know, it's a, it's kind of like what you would do for your son. You wouldn't want him going through the same mistakes that you had to go through through trial and error. So yes. if you had someone that's a new revert and they just became Muslim today, they just embraced Islam today, they're probably like, there's a lot of information. There's a lot of life changes we have to do. What plan would you give them? You know? Mm. I think that's a great question. In fact, I think um, what I do is, okay, this is what it, one of the things that it taught us in the army is to be a thinking soldier. <laughs> so we always ask questions, but I think they regretted that because now I ask a lot of questions. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, okay, um, always have a reason or like an understanding to back up what you say. Um, that is going to help your child to grow spiritually or intellectually as well. Um, that's why it's so important for us to seek knowledge. So as Muslims, seek the right knowledge as well. Uh, seek the right knowledge and to increase yourself in knowledge so that when your, your children ask you a question, you have many ways of answering them um, in the way that they would listen. Um, so f- for me, I was inquisitive. I needed a lot of answers. And a part of me also needed action. So I needed to see a person, to, a person performing the example for me. Um, so, so you have to live by the Quran, right? <laughs> That's why the Quran has the hadith and all that. We need to follow it closely. So our children, when they observe, children observe most of the time, and they copy and they follow, they mimic. That's their way of showing love, right? So that's why the first thing you teach a child is when you you pray, you just ask him to sit beside you and just watch you first, and then eventually they they learn to pray. Um, also, you know, get your family together to pray because it will help you to build a stronger bond with your wife and children. And, you know, it's really hard to get angry with someone after you pray, right? Or even before you pray, after you take a wudu, uh, it's, it's so hard to feel angry after that because you're supposed to feel calm. Don't take it like a process. Uh, don't take it like um, a motion that you just have to do. But always have this inner side of you know thinking you know why am i doing this and the purpose of doing this is to get closer to allah to purify my thoughts you know something like that instead of oh i need to take it this way sometimes as muslims i think what i found out is we focus so much on the technicalities the the little details what's halal and what's haram and what's (laughs) all those little things that we forgot the big picture we have become so microscopic that we don't see the big picture and when we lose the big picture, that's the problem because we can't guide people if we lose the big picture. People see the big picture as a vision to, towards Islam. And when we start to focus on little things, we can't you know, impart that knowledge across. So what I would say is always have both view. The microscopic one is to guide the little things, but the biggest view, like the open view you should have also as a Muslim. And the only way to have that is to increase your knowledge and to look for different teachers also, you know, not just one teacher to guide you. In fact, yeah. Most importantly, the guiding star should be the Quran and the Hadith and, of course, your, your, the teachers that you look for. Yeah, that's all I can say. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. And have you undergone any type of, like, education after that? Like, when you recited those uh, those uh, ayat, your uh, tajweed was very good, mashallah. So, do you have any uh, education that you went through, or was it mainly, like, kind of self-taught? Uh, yeah. So, uh, for the 
Ogama part part of uh, gaining knowledge. I I had a teacher that you know the guy who who helped me with shahada. He also have classes, so I started to go for his classes because I wanted to learn more about Islam. So he shared about the stories of the prophets, um, the four caliphs, and so on and so forth. So uh, that's where I got uh, basic knowledge on Islam. Um, regarding Tajweed. Uh, my f- my family in my in-laws they have uh, an Indonesian ustaza who actually guides the family in you know reciting the Quran so uh, I tag along and join them during the classes um strange thing this is a this is a miracle because she only speaks Bahasa Indonesian and a bit of English and you know I'm Chinese right in ethnicity not from China Singapore <laughs> so some people get confused. Um, the ethnicity is Chinese, um, and I speak English, and very little Malay, which is the 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 native language of my wife. <laughs> so, so technically, we can't really communicate me and this Taza, but she she just keep repeating the the Quran in Arabic and Bahasa Indo, and after a while, I picked it up. It's strange that it, I could pick up two language at the same time. Like I was picking up a bit of Indonesian and and uh, Arabic. Yeah. But wow. I, I guess, of course, I was really interested to really learn the Quran. I I have this goal in life to really hopefully memorize the whole Quran um, on to recite it over and over again because it's just so healing to the heart, right? So so it was it was also that, you know, initial fire in me that wanted to do that, that I was pursuing it so much i would download muslim pro i would you know get the books stuff so i guess that's how i progressed in in reciting the quran um and yeah how many ayahs do you know ayahs um surahs, surahs. i mean yeah, i know surahs, my bad. about uh 12 maybe 13 yeah mashallah 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 but it started from the the shortest one, so surah, so yeah, 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 uh, class and all the way up. <laughs> mm-hmm. But the, the 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 longest surah that you no know, they uh, my stars that taught me was uh, surah al muluk, and oh, after I memorized muluk, I was like every night now it's my my child's lullaby. I try to to recite that to for him to sleep, Mashallah. and it works, man. It works it works. You should try. <laughs> Mashallah. <laughs> <laughs> Masha'Allah Masha'Allah That's Masha beautiful Allah. And I'm pretty sure We're supposed to recite Surah Milk Before you fall asleep Like there's a hadith mm-hmm. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Specifying that as well mm-hmm. Yeah I believe it was Surah Milk Surah Anna Surah Al-Falak And Surah Al-Klas Right? Yeah Yes yeah. There, there are recommended. Also Ayat Al-Kursi Yeah Ayat Al-Kursi Yeah Alhamdulillah Alright Any uh, Any questions for you For us You know Let us know Um I, I I'm I'm very happy that you know you have this podcast going and you have a band of brothers here, you know, trying to share Islam with the world. I, I hope there are many of such people out there as well doing it. Um we live in a time where you know digital is at our edge, right? We have we have this digital landscape platform ready for us to share things. And um what better way to to spread you know the, the beauty of Islam? Know that it's easily available to everyone, and I think we should not miss this opportunity, um, given you know the digital landscape. Um, having said that, of course, not to forget also the old ways of learning. Even though we have a digital landscape, sometimes the old things do work better. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm I'm a big fan of you know old stuff too, <laughs> um, and um, I really hope inshallah to meet all of you even in person when this whole pandemic is over i can we can meet somewhere centralized or something <laughs> it's easy yeah, sure. Sure. yeah. yeah. And most importantly yeah. to meet all of you so in, in janitor for the Dells, right wow. that's our main goal yeah very touching episode very touching episode really packed mashallah I'm Mashallah. happy. Okay, guys. Any more questions? Just ask. <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries, yeah. guys. If you made it this far, comment down below. Hashtag bring Firdos back. 
and inshallah you will see him in the future with that being said also check the link in the description box for his channel go over and subscribe to his channel watch his videos he posts content regularly and inshallah we will see him again yeah طيب, with that being said, Jazakallah khair for an amazing episode and an amazing story. May Allah bless you immensely and we look to, we hope to have you back inshallah soon. And with that being said, Allahumma atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina adhab al-nar. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Say bismillah bro, what are you doing? Bro, it's in my head man. It's the whole... Hey, I like that, I like that. I think... There's another thing too. It's it's the perseverance aspect too. Like we're more willing to stick through with things that we set out with an intention. It's impossible to have empathy for others if you're not patient. So my love, bless you for that. First off, I'm gonna agree with the fact that the whole thing you said about friends, where it's like if, if they're affecting you more than you're affecting them, then you should probably get some new friends. You want to be investing in stocks, shares, bonds. You want to be investing in crypto because there's this thing called inflation which means every year that passes by, the value of a dollar goes lower and lower and lower. And the reason being is because they're printing more money, right? That's why money is haram. At least the paper money is haram. Provided that you're actually there and you're being a good father and the mother's being a good mother, best conditions. And behind the mic, Hamza, Andreas, Zortzis, we will go in with our final three with brother Angel, inshallah. It's not just a responsibility on you. It's a responsibility on all the children, especially your father. In our private area is very elastic. And yeah, if you go too fast, the skin will literally crease up into like the edge of like the little clipper things. And you will literally clip your skin. You don't want to be on YouTube or the internet or anything that, that amount of time. But it's, it's the, the fact is that's what we're doing.